So I'd like to say welcome and uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Olivier Krischer. I'm a usually Sydney-based art historian. Today I'm in Canberra uh, in Australia. Um, and so I'd like to acknowledge that I'm actually speaking from unceded Ngunnawal land, um, but I work and live uh, on unceded Gadigal land um, in Eora in Sydney. And I am the curator of a bridge which is showing at the WMA space in Hong Kong at the moment. Um, and today I'm moderating this conversation between uh, Tsegama, Tsegaman and um, Weiling Tei. Um, I'll just say a little note uh, first about some sort of housekeeping, I guess, um, where in a webinar format, I'm sure many of you will be familiar by now, but um, you can put some questions into the Q&A window that's on the bottom right of your um, Zoom uh, window. Um, so please do, do put your questions in there at any time during the talk, which is one of the benefits of this format. Um, of course, uh, we are recording, so this will be uh, edited and put online at a later date. So please be mindful of that. But um, since it's not sort of a live uh, question and answer, I think that should be fine. Um, I'll start with a note about this conversation. Um, and then I'll introduce our two sort of conversants or interlocutors or speakers. Um, we've organized, uh, Weiling and I have organized a few conversations like this as part of the, the process of putting this exhibition project uh, together. And these conversations have been with artists and curators to tease out um, the sorts of conceptual and also material issues that have come up in the project, um, changes in, in Weiling's practice, um, and basically trying to draw out of the project um, ideas that make it more than, um, than we, sort of more than our ideas, more than we um, have been sort of discussing. So in this conversation uh, today, um, Wellings joined by fellow artist and friend um, Tegaman to discuss their respective practices. And this is a format that we've used in previous conversations where um, both of our, our sort of speakers will present their practices in parallel and there's certain resonances and certain uh, similar similarities and differences um, that I think uh, will build a kind of conversation which is really um, very interesting from the perspective of working on the project, but also because we're thinking of, um, I guess the afterlife of the project, the sort of textual outputs as well, the way that these are drawing out um, ideas that tie together some of um, Welling's practice and also you know, imply a, a larger body of, of discourse in, with which it's in conversation. So amid shifts in photo technology and visual discourse, I think Welling and Gaman's work shares a close familiarity. Um, they're both quite familiar with each other's practices as well as their sort of journeys um, in artistic practice and education. Um, and they share certain concerns about photography as what we've discussed prior to today's conversation uh, in preparation, we discussed it as a troubled medium. Uh, so they have photographed also both in Hong Kong uh, as a site of memory, um, potentially loss, transformation and change, especially um, at the moment. And so in both of their work, I think there's also this sense of Hong Kong as somewhere that you look back on and to, um, but yet you also photograph in the present. So they've worked closely also with forms of portraiture and their approach to making portraits is something which I think we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, Gaman's photographic practice attends to the medium's ability not simply to record, but also form um, or enact relationships, to witness relationships. Her work has often been a personal reflection on Asian American identity, um, queer identities, as well as picturing queerness in Hong Kong. Uh, she is an artist and educator based in New York, where she's the director of the BFA in photography at Parsons School of Design. She's exhibited very widely in both Hong Kong and the US and elsewhere. And her recent exhibitions include Art on the Stoop, Sunset Screenings at uh, the Brooklyn Museum, Chosen at Leslie Lohman Museum in New York and Tate Lates at the Tate Museum in London. She's also the recipient of the Robert Yard Fellowship, the Aperture Portfolio Prize and the Aaron Siskin Fellowship. And her award-winning monograph, Narrow Distances, was published by Candor Arts in 2018. And I think we'll see some of that beautiful work today. 
But curatorial projects include Daybreak New Affirmations in Queer Photography at the Leslie Lohman uh, Museum, which was co-curated with Matt Jensen and Unruly Visions in partnership with the Hong Kong International Photography Festival, featuring work by emerging LGBTQ photographers in Hong Kong. And her writing has been published in Best Letters from Asian Americans, edited by Christopher K. Ho and Daisy Nam, and Photo No Nos, edited by Jason Fulford. Um, she's also working on a book uh, in collaboration with Stephanie Xu and six non-binary writers uh, titled My Race is My Gender, which is coming out soon through Rutgers University Press. Um, I'll also introduce, although many of you, I guess, will be familiar with Weiling's work. Um, she's a, a cross-disciplinary artist, despite having a, a practice rooted in photography. She works also with video and sound, and there's elements of both of this, these sorts of media in a bridge. She's interested in the ways uh, we see and present the world in images, and her work has often been inspired by uh, family histories and friends and her own, both her own and those of people she meets or gets acquainted with. And these sorts of interpersonal connections are something that I think we'll talk about. Um, she's also been working with archival materials and social environments. So a lot of her work has been made in Hong Kong where she lived uh, and worked between 1999 and 2015. Her experience with photojournalism is, is something that informs her practice and particularly the Abridge project, um, at which we'll hear about, I think, in a moment. So Welling received her MFA from Bard's College, Bard College's Milton Avery Graduate School of the Arts, uh, and her works have been collected by significant collections, uh, museum collections, including the National University of Singapore Museum, National Taiwan Museum of Fine Arts and the Fukuoka Asian Art Museum and Kiyosato, Kiyosato Museum of Photographic Arts in Japan, as well as the Heritage Museum in Hong Kong. She's received awards, including the Art Creation Fund from National Arts Council Singapore and the Point of Fellowship from Yale School of Art. Finally, before I do hand over to, to Weiling to sort of walk us through some of her practice, um, and that will be followed by Garman also talking through some of her practice to sort of set the scene for our conversation and your questions. Uh, I'd like to say a word about the title of today's event, our conversation, which um, we chose to title Before the Picture. Um, it's a phrase, before the picture is a phrase that came up in our initial discussions in preparation for this conversation, which I, I really liked as it seemed to articulate both the act of not only looking, but being present with and in front of the, the picture, not only as a sort of image. The idea of being seen by the picture or the picture returning your gaze. Yet it also speaks to the work that happens before the picture or the image is made the discussions, the interviews, just the living that all contribute to the way that we make images. And that's something that I think that um, both of our, our speakers will be um, touching on uh, today. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to, to that. So without um, further ado, this is kind of the most that I think I'll be, be saying, I'll be guiding the conversation along. Um, and although that's a long introduction, uh, I'm really, um, encouraging everyone that this is uh, quite a comfortable and familiar conversation. And that's something that we've been really trying to, um, to foreground, I guess, is the sort of personal and, and the value of that sort of intimacy and friendship um, in these works. Um, so Welling, I'd like to first sort of hand over to you and um, ask you to share your screen to bring up um, your, your discussion to, to sort of set the scene and then um, I'll turn to you, Kaman. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to share a screen at the moment. Do you see it? Yeah. Um, thank you for we, joining but us. We, oh, but we see like your preview slide too, if you want to switch oh. it. Yeah. Yeah. How do I do that? Um, just before we started, the play mode seemed to work fine. Maybe try again. Okay. Do you now see it as an 
as its own thing. Single, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, I pulled it off my screen, I guess. Uh, give me one minute then, sorry. I'm, today I'm showing not uh, just the works in a bridge because but as we were talking about our practices, I was, I'm going to show a few a work that I've been, I've been doing at the same time as a, as a bridge, but also starting with this image, um, which is a sheet of slides from the other shore. So just very briefly, um, for many years, my work, I worked a lot with people and interviews and I would meet and interview people and all, and then photograph them. And so this, the other shore, which is kind of a precursor to a bridge really, uh, was part of that mode of working. Uh, so with a bridge, it's um, a bridge started in 2018. So it is a continuation of the other shore, which was looking and meeting looking at a meeting with young mainlanders who had come to Hong Kong in the mid 2000s and kind of thinking about their lives and you know how they were going about. A bridge was a continuation of that in looking further backwards and thinking about that relationship that Hong Kong has with China and also then an earlier generation of people who had come to Hong Kong from the 60s uh, to the early 2000s. With all of these, you know, for many years, I have been interested in these kind of cross-border relationships, you know, uh, and these cross-border realities, you know, why people come, how they come, when they come, and if when they come influences how they see themselves. And so one of the things that really influenced bridge and the making of the photos were the interviews that I had with these people who had come in uh, how they were talking to me. You know, I met with a lot of um, um, older aunties and uncles or grandmas and grandpas who, who were talking about the journey of crossing, but also then knowing that that journey was from a specific time and that it could potentially create a kind of way of how they were seen. So in that sense, that made me think about how I would think about how I was looking back at Hong Kong in a similar way of how they were looking back at um, China, where they come from, and the kind of slippages and the kind of ways that we were building up maybe ways of remembering or maybe ways of forgetting. So with a bridge, I took a lot of the photographs that I made when I was working as a photographer in Hong Kong, um, working doing editorial and news, but also um, as a portrait photographer and also an art practice. So, so what I was interested also in was the materiality and the objecthood of, of these photographs um, and how they could help one think about the past. So these are some pictures from the exhibition that's currently going on uh, w at WMA. So for example, one of the things that I was interested in, uh, or I am interested in, is the kind of surface and the kind of materiality of that surface and how it can help us think about that past and that present and how that surface can reveal if you can see here, you know, um, on the surface. So in, it's, it's, they're printed on very reflective C prints. Uh, so these photographs are made from the analog slides and negatives and contact sheets that I originally made. I re-photographed them with my iPhone, and then I then made them into um, larger format C-prints. Uh, also then again, taking the, the medium and relating that also back to that idea of memory and how I can think about where that past has come from and where it can go, and then maybe in a way closing that loop. So the, this photo, um, that I was talking about in terms of the surface, you see it in person, it's, it's 120 cm wide. You can see the surface of the slide, the 
the I guess a little bit of the deterioration and the residue. So you can see droplets of water actually on the surface. Uh, but you can also see the re-rendering with the iPhones. So you can see the kind of pixelation that the, the this kind of consumer product creates. Um, and, and then when it's you know um, expanded into a larger fine art print, that was something that I was interested in again in how then it can then help us think or help me think about what I'm creating, what how that object, the place of that object uh, in thinking about this past. This is another um, picture also. So one of the things together with the materiality was also that compression of that past and the present. And so also then think about how do you foreground and how do you background the past and the present. Uh, so this work particularly, I guess in, in the re-photographing, there's a lot of reflections um, of the present where I photographed it. You see the sky, so I photographed it in Singapore. You see this, the Singaporean sky uh, with this, you know, this um, backdrop from Causeway Bay where you see a part of it, but also as a viewer stands in front of the print, it's, it's because of its own um, reflective surface, the viewer also gets enmeshed in that, in that past or that present. So then in that photographic object, you skip, keep seeing this loop again of that past and that present of that self and that other that you keep seeing um, in the object. This is another um, picture of the exhibition. And then, so this is another work that I wanted to bring up that is, is a little bit more figurative also uh, on, I guess at first glance, it looks like there's a woman looking in to, you know, into a room and it's actually a picture in the room I'm in right now in Singapore. Uh, the title, uh, so going back to the title, so the titles for all the works, they describe the place, uh, yeah, the type of film that was used, uh, sometimes the type of used film that wasn't used and then, um, yeah, and the, and the size of it. So in this instance, I wanted to put in the other project, so the other show into it, because she was one of the participants in that project. And I wanted to then kind of relate that back to what I had done before um, in that sense. But one of the reasons why I think this is one of my favorite pictures is that it, it, it becomes, it's very deceptive, I think for me in that, you know, is she, in front or is she in the back? But if on a closer inspection, when you look at the picture, you know, you start to realize that she is actually um, in front of that present. So that past is in front of that present uh, in literally in the photo where you then see that kind of leakage from the, the, the slide that I photographed through um, onto the, the, the window frame that was the present. With this, I want to kind of then move on to another project very quickly uh, that I had done at the same time as a bridge. And this is again, thinking about the photograph and the photographic object and what it can do uh, in terms of thinking about a past, but it also is about thinking about these, I guess, uh, journeys that we take and these relationships that we have that um, influence these journeys and these memories. I just included this, um, this is my aunt. So it's just, you know, a lot of my work deals with the family and, and particularly my family. And in this instance with the slides, it will be my family that uh, you will see. Uh, and, and this was for another project that she was a part of. This is in Malaysia, but then also she was one of the images in the slides. Um, that I used, which will come up. Uh, that is her. So in this in this work also, the, the photographic object and the medium was very important. And I highlight this in the title of the work. So what you see at the bottom uh, below the image is uh, the title of, um, of the work. It, it's, it's very, for me, non-editorial. It's, it's just descriptive of how it was found, where it was found, what was used to transform it from that original object um into the final object um that was quite important for me so this this these images come from that you'll see and they, these works come from actually a bag of slides i found in my mother's in my mother's apartment in 2019 uh, she was moving and she had this bag and she didn't want it anymore and i took it and in there were six boxes of slide film and they were all family photographs 
from the late 60s to the early 70s. And for me, they were quite poignant because they were from a time when my parents were still in school uh, in Australia and till when they had gone back to Malaysia and Singapore and then started a family. Uh, so that time of transition for me, and it was also a time, you know, when you know, there was a lot of hope and the family was just starting. And similarly, it was also at a time, I think with, in terms of Singapore, um, post-independence in the late 60s, where again, you know, there is this idea of building, this idea of nation building, and how then do you sit this individual, these individual lives alongside these larger um, political narratives. But then, so one of the things was, I was also very excited because they were all slides. And for many years, I used slides um, for most of my work and they were very particular slides. They were, this body of work, they were actochrome slides, uh, protochrome slides and agfa, agfa slides, which uh, created a very specific color deterioration. And so one of the things for me was that these works then through the materiality of the photographic object could depict um, the history that it had experienced, so to speak. You know, so instead of then thinking about that archival image uh, of you know that that representation within that archival image, you know, who this person was, where this person was, how that place looked like in that time, the the kind of rendering of that object in its entirety then allowed me to also you know look at you know for the for the specific trajectory that the object had gone through from let's say Australia to to I think Penang to Singapore, for example, I don't know what the middle is, it's Malaysia somewhere. You, it, it passed through that, it passed through specific hands, it was touched by specific people, it went through specific ge geographies and environments to come to the state. And so with this work, I used a microscope uh, to, to make the images. And so one of the things that was really interesting for me with microscope also is that it really changes uh, how you actually see the image from in the sense, I'm, I was very used to, you know, using, let's say, film, medium format film, SLR cameras, now a mirrorless camera, uh, and then using a, a microscope that actually renders a, a three-dimensional image that is then flattened into a two-dimensional image. Um, so this is, for example, one of the slides. And so I just wanted to show you, this, that's an exhibition. I'm just going to move forward because I wanted to show you the image where this, for example, where then that your, your three dimensionality is flattened into a two dimensionality. So where then this is a close up of the image where then you see that life that is on the surface, but also you see that the, with the reflective surface of the slide of the photographic object, it shifts. If you see from the left, it's a lot more highlighted than the middle just because of the curvature and the deterioration of the slide. So it, it really incorporates um, not only the kind of temporal and geographic shifts that are happening uh, with this history, it also really, the apparatus is really, really important in, in then how you can see and feel. It becomes so tactile, I think. Um, yeah. Am I talking about this for way too long? Is that good? <laughs> but I, I just wanted to show this as a, as a, as a thing where you know, it's the practice is shifting. So for example, in terms of a bridge, I was using a very low tech, you know, it's a consumer phone camera, which I guess nowadays is also very high tech, but I wanted something that was a lot, a lot more intimate and a lot more personal where it's, and it's a lot more, um, a wider use where, where, you know, every, most people take photos nowadays with, I say take photos, take photos nowadays with their phones, right? And so, so I wanted that to be a key instrument in that project, whereas this project, I, I wanted to find a way to be able to, articulate that history and that past and that journey. So then, then the, the microscope seemed um, quite appropriate. Yeah. And one of the things also is, uh, I think it's just a, a geeking out is that with this work, let's say, you, what you see on the silver and this is an example of how environment becomes very obvious and that historic history and that passage of time becomes obvious is that the, the silver markings you see are actually crystallized uh, extrusions of the plastic through, you know, through the kind of color chips. So then you then also have the object itself, you know, responding to the kind of environment and temporal shift um, progression, I guess, so to speak, uh, that, that creates these new um, things in the sense that kind of remaking of that history uh, and, and remaking of that historical object.
So then uh, from here, I will go back to the exhibition and I talk about one last work. Oh, I'm talking way too long. Should I stop? Yes, I will Keep talk going. about it later. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll talk about one, one more thing. And just uh, in terms of going back to the exhibition and thinking about the medium and thinking about, um, I guess, how it really influences us. And so one of the works that's in the show is this work. Uh, it's called Live Streaming Prince Edward. Uh, 12th of November 2019, uh, 23.35.06. It's the timestamp, 25 frames per second, 1920 times 1080. Uh, again, I guess a, re a reflection for me of the apparatus that was used to create images. Uh, so when I was in Hong Kong, one of the things that um, was for me made me think was how, how do we all experience um, something like that, you know, how, and one of the things that really struck me was the screen and how it was really mediating most people's experiences um, of, the, um, of the event uh, in terms of uh, seeing it, in terms of sharing it, in terms of transmitting it, um, in terms of understanding it almost. And so I wanted, at first, you know, I kind of said, I am not taking any pictures of this. I really don't want to be disseminating this and as we know you know uh, photographs can be used for many it has they have an afterlife that we really can't control uh, so so then um i wanted to think about how can we work with this and there was one night when i didn't go out and i was uh, staying at my friend's place and um watching this um and i was just thinking how you know there were people across the neighborhood across the you know the island who was watching the same thing as me and who was experiencing this and in 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 that moment the kind of communal moment that was also at the same time totally you know isolating so this work uh just comprises 25 frames um in one second so i was uh recording it with a an appell format and um it's it is in my of my i was recording the tv that was streaming what was going on on the streets because i didn't go out um and it was a recording framed in my friend's living room, you know, surrounded by her toy, her, her children's toys. Um, I guess, and also with one of my older photos from Guy and Lay above the TV. Again, uh, I guess for me, that kind of reflexivity again um, with that past. But it was for me quite important that, that this was situated, um, you know, in that environment that everybody shared, but then also then to, um, to break down that moment I think, but also then in, in how then when it's installed, again, that, that, that time, that one second becomes a kind of physical way of experiencing um, this, this moment, you know, in terms of how you have to walk, in terms of how you have to come close, in terms of how you have to look really closely to see the change and see how people are really running across the um, screen. And that for me, um, I guess this was another exploration of the medium. Yes, that I work with. Thank you. Thanks, Wiling. Do you have a close up of that image? I think there's one more slide, right? Um, so, what, what we'll do is um, I invite everyone to kind of keep their, their questions. There's already a lot going on there. And same for Gaman, to sort of keep your questions in mind uh, while we turn then to, to your work um, and sort of invite you to share your screen. Um, oh, sorry, I'm stopping. Okay, I'm going to share a screen now. Can you see my slide? Yeah, okay. Um, I will share like a sort of a mix of work, some from narrow distances and then some, some new work. So I'll just move quickly on, um, like in my, in my practice, I work with um, sort of questioning and trying to expand notions of like family, like thinking of like the, you know, 
family is both also like inherited as well as chosen, like a expanded notion of family, like a queer kinship. And so there's pictures like this in the book where, you know, in these sort of rare moments where my um, wife and my parents are in the at the same table sharing a meal and how 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 important that was at that time when we were making that picture in 2014. And the, the book jumps a lot in time and place. And so from you know pictures made in Schenectady where I where I grew up uh, in Schenectady, New York to like New York City to Hong Kong. And there's a mix of like landscapes and portraits and still lives and even um, writing in the book um, and a, what, a WhatsApp screen grab. And the beginning of the book starts with these pictures that I made in the early 2000s in um, the Gaugaitra on the old airport. Um, and so after the handover, it was still, there's still like remnants of these buildings and there were things still intact and I would keep returning to the site, this like, um, this like location of departure and like even just thinking about, you know, immigrating in the early eighties. Um, and it was important for me to like keep returning to this spot until, I mean, I'll, I'll most of it through the years, um, you know, really got demolished. And this is a portrait of my dad in the airport in 2006. And the, the book sort of spans from 2004 to 2018. This is like a self-portrait. Um, this is a still life that was made in my parents' home where I'm, I'm really actually reenacting a, a nightmare I had where I was like drinking water, like going down the stairs, and like drinking water and the water and the glass turns into broken glass, like in my throat. And so much of the, uh, the project is about trying to um, connect these seemingly disparate or disconnected worlds and also like trying to understand like who I was and trying to build a sense of community, but also like about like loss and also like um, language. Um, and so this was a key picture in the book as well. And then there's these pictures where um, it's a, you know, similar process with Wailing, just a lot of, a lot of like, a lot of listening, you know, it, it stems from interviews and conversations and it's really dialogical and really um, having these long conversations and trying to figure out what, what is an important place or, or space and what building these mental images together. Um, and so in these pictures, they, they, they really come through a lot of like talking through what's, what's important um, and thinking about lived experience and a, a site that matters or um, a memory that matters. And then we, we work to build that image back together. Um, using, uh, most of the time using a four by five camera. So then there's like shifts where I'm also, this is made in New York and I'm also like letting go of the four by five occasionally <laughs> and using a handheld camera. And then really thinking about how to, how to like fracture an image or even talk about like the construction of identity, and obviously using like a mirror to, to, or a series of, or a set of mirrors to do that in this picture. Um, this is the, the old airport again, but years later. And it was a thing that sort of came through like a talk I was giving in New York at a, um, at a college. And after the talk, was, someone from the audience came up and said, I know Mikiki Mall. I've been to like the high rises, the apartments above that you're talking about. I have a friend who can like get you in. <laughs> and I was like, great, let's connect. And then I was able to make this picture because of that person who came up to me after a talk back when we were doing in-person art artist talks. Um, I'll move quicker because um, the work shifts. So they go from these like exterior pictures where it was really important to like occupy and like take over public space um, and how important it was to like, to make those portraits and make them, make them in these spaces that were often like contested um, or contingent. And then they, the work in the book shifts to these interior pictures. Um, 
then you know there's also this range of like what like portraits of people in space uh to like lived experience like in the in like in homes so thinking about how at first it was a rule that I built for myself um and then being able to sort of break that rule to say like yes I can make pictures and inside or even on beds or in bathrooms and then the book pretty much ends with a this really open uh, photograph, uh, um, a portrait of a, a couple. Um, and it's actually the same site that is, um, that Wayling showed from the very top of the, of her, her talk. So I'm trying to think of like bookends of um, this site too, which is no longer accessible, right? Um, I think they closed, they closed that off to the public. The work, my work really shifted in 2019 and um that was a you know that was a pretty challenging year and I think I'm really just going to show like a few pictures uh from that summer and really thinking about how to make work out of out of that moment of loss and th these were these are like two pictures that I made that same summer that were more abstracted and sort of further further out but I was really thinking about that gesture of, of fishing with just a line and just like casting, the gesture of like a hand casting into just like wide open water. And like, what does that mean? These are screen grabs from fall of 2019. Um, and so I'm, I'm jumping from time from being, being, being at the site um, to then returning back to New York and also sort of following the news through um, my phone or through the computer. And I lived with these two screen grabs. I lived with these pictures that I've made on a handheld digital Rico camera um, that I didn't really know what to do with. And then I lived with these two screen grabs for a long time and trying to like think of well, what does it mean for me to look at this, look at these images that kept circulating, um, but what does it mean like while sitting here in, in New York, while also holding our brand new, like our, our newborn. Um, so at the time where there was this rupture and so much loss um, that I felt that we had experienced. Um, and when like the world was for, felt like to me was like breaking was also the moment that we, our baby was born. And so I was literally like this, all the time because you know newborns don't they just sleep whenever and they also need to sleep on your body for like warmth and comfort and so I was thinking about this picture which was in the news at the time and then like this is just a cell phone picture and like the hold and what does that mean and I was thinking about space like the space the space that I would traverse to make narrow distances and actually like mapping making our own map of Hong Kong um, in all the different sites that everyone chose in the work to like the spaces of all these important sites that were so key in 2019. And then my space completely compressed to the space between me and my child. Um, and that hold of like, he's just his like tiny hand up my armpit. <laughs> um, and then how that really shifted. And so this was one of the first works I made um, coming out of that that experience and like really struggling with um, like really thinking through what does it mean to make work? What does it mean to make photographs or even to circulate them? Um, and so it was really important to like do this work and also to not show in this video, it's really about me holding my child, but also to not show his face. But years later, I mean, now, now my, he's two, really understanding that I wasn't comforting him like he was like the, the gesture of me holding him was actually trying to comfort myself but in this video it's like a two-channel piece i'm just rocking him like at all hours of the night until dawn and then the surge protector becomes the red the red sirens and then the humidifier becomes plumes um and it's just these little signals of like the sort of memory that i had while this like 
that I'm carrying while holding him. And then this new work is really recent. It's from this summer, uh, this year, this calendar year. And it's from a project that I'm doing with a friend. Um, and it's a book project, it's called um, My Race is My Gender. And it features six non-binary writers. And they're, they're each writing this intensely personal essay. And from that, I'm reading the text and I'm doing interviews with each of the writers. And um, similar to narrow distances, we're working together to figure out um, what kind of picture, what kind of portrait to build to accompany these essays in the book. And unlike narrow distances, it's like the opposite of like a monograph, limited edition monograph that's hard to access. It's like the size of a pocket, kind of like a pocket paperback that you could put in a winter coat pocket, kind of tiny, you know, tiny trim size, super accessible, like around 20 bucks. And um, um, it's, you know, the hope is that it more readers and viewers can access the, the work. And so these portraits were made this summer, uh, mostly in New York. And uh, this is a portrait of Ignacio, Ignacio in Baltimore um, and Ari in their home in Brooklyn. And, and it's similarly through that process of like, what is, what is important to you? Um, how, how do you want this image to be built? Um, and what does it mean to be seen? Um, and I think that's it. This is the last slide. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Kaman. Um, I, I have my own questions, but I'm going to, as I said before, I'm going to hand over to, to Wailing first um, to kind of uh, open up a conversation between your two uh, presentations and practices. And at the same time, I'll just remind people that um, we can take questions in the Q&A window at any time. So um, feel free to post questions or comments as well, um, including about specific images that you'd like people to bring up um, and talk about again. Uh, we can do that as well. So um, over to you, Willie. Um, I wanted to ask, so we had both prepared questions, but then as you were showing those, um, photos and also those newer photos, it, the idea of touch really uh, came back to me again. And I think that this has uh, kind of stayed in my mind for, I guess many years ago. I don't know if you, you remember uh, when, 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we were I guess, looking at your photographs. And I think one of my questions was, why do people have to touch or why do I <laughs> but, but for me, just looking also at the new work um, in terms of the screen grabs uh, and also the new with the ocean, it really looks, uh, uh, it is so poignant, you know, but then they, they have, they, uh, by the same way, they're different. So uh, for me, I, I like to know for touch in the photo, you know, how it has changed for you from maybe that earlier project um, to what it is now. Yeah, I, I remember you asking me that years and years ago. <laughs> and then I was actually trying from that question, I was trying to like force myself to make different kinds of pictures and like, what can I show people interacting in a space without doing that, right? Without like touching. And then I, there, there are pictures that, you know, made it into a certain edit and, but it, it was a really, it was such an important challenge at the time. Um, because it, it was a shorthand. It was a shorthand way to show intimacy and like a shorthand way to, to signal queerness. Like even holding hands in public is like, you know, still a big deal, I think. Um, and so, but you know, it was like, it was like, it was easy. Like it was a, it was such an easy way to signal queerness or intimacy. And I needed to like break that. Um, so I always appreciated that question or challenge. But I think touch is really important because, you know, and this is, I'm borrowing from Teju Cole, but, you know, so many senses are not like, the, you know, you can, you can look without, you know, being looked back at, upon, right? Like you can look without being seen. You can hear someone without them hearing you. But like touch is like absolutely reflexive where like 
all parties are together, right? Um, and so that's like a shift too in the senses and also like what is in relation, like, you know, um, so like I think about that then also like the, the touch now is about like, like really truly about care. Um, and it's like, a, like what does like truly like caretaking mean? I mean, there were pictures and there are distances that were about care, like caring for a city, caring for a space, caring for each other or a community. Um, and bit, but maybe I think the this this the change really happens when like when I thought I was comforting um, my child, like a newborn who couldn't sleep through the night. Only years later, do I realize that like I re I needed to be comforted because I was still crying every night and like from heartbreak. Um, so I think there's like I don't know maybe that's I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> um, yeah, but, I, but I, for me, the, 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 the fishing line pictures, I think that, that, that lack of, you know, that, that lack of, that lonely, that it, it's very palpable, I think. And so then it's, 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 it's very emotional. I think the, the, in terms of, I guess, the emotional tenor has really shifted I think, from the earlier ones to these. Can I jump in and ask, because the first photo that you showed, which I think is, um, is beautiful, and I kind of wanted to go back to this idea of beauty later, um, because it sort of hovers in both of your works, but where it looks like you're touching the photo that's being held. Mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that your hand? Yeah, that is my hand in the middle. Um, and then the other hands are my yima and yijirong. And my yima is actually in the photograph and she's 17 at the time in the photograph. It's a wedding. It's um, my oldest uncle's wedding. Uh, she was 17 and then when we were making the picture, she was 73. So it was like this sort of like loop of like all of us holding this picture together. And she's really the like oral historian of the family and mm. like the, you know, she's really like through her, I like, like have learned so much about my mom and my family. Um, so it was really important for us to all like hold and also look at this picture together. Yeah, there was something about that, which for me, um, uh, it, it, it seems such a familiar gesture in some ways that like the way we interact with um, like photographs on day to day and particularly in family is, is to touch them. You know, and even when they're in photo albums, you know, we've probably all been in that sort of situation where people kind of like just put it with their hand across the surface and kind mm -hmm. of you know, you're feeling something that's not there anymore. Um, and there was something in that gesture, which to me seemed on the one, on the one hand, so, um, uh, what's the word? Something that we would take for granted, but is never pictured. You know, we never see that, that touch, um, that action usually. Uh, which is funny because in your work as well, Wailing, you, you've kind of gone out of your way to, to picture yourself handling the material. Um, and so I, you know, they're coming from very different perspectives and yet still, you know, there's that sense of, of touch that you were just talking about, Gamma, and there's something, you know, intrinsically kind of reflexive um, and, and physically, like literally physically kind of bridging the distance, um, which as you do in that image, which I think is really, um, really interesting that, that it's shared in your, in your projects. Um, I, I will, um, sorry, I'll let you pose your question. Um, and, and well, and well, this is not a question, but Wailing also reminds me of the project you did a couple of years ago where you were printing those pictures, the family pictures on tissue paper and inviting visitors to, for, to the museum to like actually touch and to hold on. Oh yeah, ooh, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. I no, 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 it's, but it, um, maybe it, maybe this is time to, to jump from like that, that tissue paper and how ephemeral and fragile that feels to then the slides that you were just showing, the um, thinking, I mean, I'm, I'm really thinking through all of, all of your work because I've had the, I've had the privilege to know your work for so long, but, you know, 
process has always been so important to your work. Um, and I'm just that, but also like time, like time is like in all of the bodies of work. And I'm, I'm really curious how you're thinking about extending and distending and um, layering time um, in these in these new works in both the the um, the microscope pictures of the slides um, as well as the you know the the work from a bridge um, how everything's kind of seems to expand and then contract back and you know and it just keeps going like this you know that's not a question. Maybe I should just ask how is <laughs> how does time does time play a role in your work? How ha, process being so important in your work, how has that changed or not changed? In terms of um, I can talk about process first, uh, just as a general thing, uh, that I don't actually talk so much to people anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Since coming back to Singapore um, for you know, whatever reason. But I, I look a lot more at the photograph and I look a lot more at the medium and I guess how it is manipulated or used can speak to me or you know speak to something else. So, so for example, with the slides, it was quite exciting that with that work that uh, number one, it really changed my idea of what a photograph is or how a photograph is made. So, because I was really shocked um, when I was looking at initial um, versions of the final work when it was maybe not sharp enough or it was reflective. Or so I was like, what am I looking at? Is, is this not sharp enough? I'm not sure what, what this is. And then I realized this is a different way of making a visual image. Um, so then I really had to shift what I thought was a, an okay photo or a good photo or a proper photo in terms of just these kinds of technical things and also then realizing what I'm seeing is not actually, it is two-dimensional, but it actually isn't two-dimensional. So then it really shifted my idea or that, that, that visuality, you know, that is embedded in that object. Um, so that was quite exciting. But also then, also and then in terms of also then the bridge work, um, how the photograph how the photographic object, how that document is not necessarily just documenting through representation of the image, right? That it is documenting just because of what it is. Uh, I guess you could say that of many objects around us, but then at the same time, what it has is it has that, that image from that past, but that, that is embedded in all that it has accumulated as an object. So that, that for me was also, is also very exciting. Uh, so then in terms of then going back to looking at my older photos, I think, um, I think it came very naturally and also was stemming from, from the start of the bridge project in the sense of, you know, how do you photograph this? And I think that I had mentioned this to you before and you had said that you wanted to talk about it, how I thought my photos were dated. <laughs> like some of my earlier works which I thought they were dated and and um and so then it was just then for me how if, if using a certain type of apparatus for me at this point doesn't seem suitable how else then can I think about that past how can I photograph it um with a different machine how can I uh print it how what kind of material can I use that all then starts to influence um um, I guess the outcome or that photograph that is made. I, I, I don't know, did I jump? I don't know if I'm being vague there. You're good. <laughs> Come on, um, is that what you were thinking about in terms of, because um, it's something that we did talk a little bit about um, when Wailing was saying that she felt her work was dated. Um, I think there was more more to that comment in some ways, um, particularly in relationship to a bridge and the sort of the image worlds in, in mm -hmm. which is making work uh, something that you were also talking about in terms of you know how to make images um uh in in, in relationship to other events and when you, you know you know what's happening elsewhere and um the, yeah do you want to come back to to your question on on that I guess? yeah because I, I think like the you know the the dated question you know 
like maybe it's like what do you mean when you say your photographs are dated like or is it really just about um our or your your relationship to to the medium itself has changed and um like what parts of it you know um frustrate you and what parts of it um excite you you know like we 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 both have spent a lot of time um you know, talking about other works of other artists. And I, I, I've always sort of like enjoyed that sort of, um, that sort of like push. And so like, as, as image makers now, like what, what are things that you want to throw away or what are things that you want to keep or nurture or what are things that you want to call out? Like, how do we trouble the medium that is so troubled, right? Yeah, I was when I was looking at um, narratives when you were making it at um, back a few years ago when we met in Hong Kong. But you were also at some point that's what, when you started using the thirty-five millimeter. I was actually quite intrigued because because it, it looks so different. It, it's 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 for example that picture of the fractured the mirror picture, right? That's a thirty-five millimeter um, um, photograph. And so then for me. It, uh, how how do you see that sitting uh, alongside your four by five photographs? Does it matter? The what you know in terms of the shape, in terms of the uh, the shape. I mean, the shape then makes it more cinematic because it's longer. It's it's actually a digital, it's like a, a a digital handheld camera. Um, but it also like free. There are just moments when I think the gadgets and gadgets get in the way, like for me at least. Um, and so when, when the four by five is in the way of me actually making or in the way of me being able to see and respond, then that, then that has to be, I can't just continue to make that kind of work. Um, and so using a handheld like did allow me to sort of just open up like, and it, it does feel like a totally different picture um, and even the medium format pictures that are, um, they just, they feel more loose and like lived um, and less, less stiff, you know. Can I, can I kind of dwell on that a little bit? Because one of my questions here was, was about the apparatus. And, and I, I mean, I, re I really like this term because in some ways it implies other sorts of things connected to the camera and you know other processes. And whether you've talked a bit about this in, in relationship to obviously not only a bridge, but also the microscopic sort of work that you've been doing, which I think really eloquently talks to this relationship between the three dimensionality and two dimensionality of the image. But I wanted to come back to you, Gaman, because in some of your previous, um, like in the interviews and, um, and talking about your work, you've mentioned using four by five and, and the, the relationship of that format to time and mm -hmm. you know, as a form of resistance. And I thought that's really interesting because in, in the images that we've seen from a bridge, it's, it's quite obvious the kind of layering, you know, not in a bad way, but it's, it's happening. You know, the surface of the image is kind of being problematized and mm -hmm. um, that texture is there. And so in that respect, it's making the photo thicker, you, you might say, mm -hmm. you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of extruding um, these layers. Um, whereas in the images that you've um, shown from narrow distances where there is this kind of deep stillness sometimes, which I think other people have also commented on the sense of stillness in some of your work, um, which you've presented as a kind of resistance. And I was wondering, you know, that, that's very interesting because it's almost like, um, something hidden in plain sight that you know like the more you see the more that the image seems open the more it it, it sort of invites you to look behind the, <laughs> what mm -hmm. you can see if that makes sense so mm -hmm. the, so the so the, the image itself is not fractured and yet you still seem to be able to create an atmosphere in which the past and the present like various moments are accumulating and kind of being muddled um, you know, pushing against a sort of linearity or two dimensionality. And I, I, I wondered if that's because you've commented about that in relationship to four by five, 
you know, if that's something that is going through your mind in terms of the apparatus itself and those sorts of choices, because we, we usually talk about the image mm -hmm. when we talk about photography, not really about the tools and the, the, the sort of equipment which photographers themselves or artists will often actually discuss or be interested in, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, 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 um, it is a 19th century tool, right? Um, that is all mechanical and it's just like, there's nothing electronic or digital about it. And it's also extremely clunky. So, you have to be really slow um, and it will it's often taken me hours to make you know 10 or 20 pictures like multiple hours like six hours um, so it's just a really slow process but but that slowness is like for me like the only like I've talked about it like a lot too is like the only way to resist um, um, capitalism <laughs> and this like this like urge for you know to be productive or to be efficient and so it's the most inefficient most ongoing like kind of way of working which is why it works <laughs> um but i mean time yeah i think about how to like slow time or compress time um but you know that brings me back to your work whaling and like I want to go back to the 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 live stream pictures. I want to go back to that this the picture with your hand your hand is reflected in the print and there's like your phone is reflected in the print and then that Causeway Bay picture where it's just the gray blue abstraction. Um, and in in those in those pictures I'm I'm thinking about how you're layering, you're layering time, you're like using this idea of like the usable past and these like, these acts of recuperation, right? And then, but then there's this utter refusal. Like if, if we're talking about resistance, there's like an utter, I, they're both, they're, they're alluring and I like wanna keep looking at them, especially the, that really liquid picture that we were talking about just before we went like live. But at, they're alluring and I want to keep going into the pictures, but there's also this refusal that pushes back. And that's even the surface of the print that you chose that reflects, that's so highly reflective that one, even though I haven't seen the show in person, like I'm just looking at the slides, like that in how you describe it is that the viewer, the, the viewer is in, in the print too. So there's like so many layers of time and, and we're implicated. So like you're talking about questioning the stability of the image, but then you're also like implicating us as a viewer standing before the print too. Um, maybe that's not a question, but do you think about the work as refusing the gaze? Like, like if we trouble the medium of photography and there's like so many, so many photographers who are talking about pushing back and refusing the gaze, do you think about that in the, in those pieces? When you say the gaze, are you saying that specifically? Or are you saying... Uh, no, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think that with those works, um, with the remaking of... or re-photographing of that object, like I wanted to think about a different way that you can look back at that object and how you how it is not just about looking at what was photographed before um, in that sense. Uh, I think that's the very um, easy way of answering me, but it, it, I'm, it's not a question of refusing, right? It's a question of shifting how we can understand how what, what had happened before. So for example, um, many of those photographs were actually done on assignment for news and things, let's say with the protests and things in 2003 and things like that. So, you know, when back then, when I was photographing, you know, I worked, it's, it's media, you know, you're, you're, you're the, the photographs have a purpose. So it, when you take them out of that context, the very specific context that they use, you know, this is um, 17 years later, how can you, I think about what happened back then, you know, as the person who had 
taken the photo as a person who was a part of that protest or as a person you know who who was also then a foreigner in that place uh, you know participating so 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 then then it's like how do you how can i go back and look at that also then or, you know so then also then my relationship with media with the news has also shifted in my understanding of what it is what it does you know how we put pictures out how pictures actually circulate these days you know how you know what circulated of that event in 2003 is very different from what circulated in 2019 let's say or how things can circulate so so then then for me it's not a refusal but it, i think it's an acknowledgement of the change that of the role of the photograph or or then then also then that difficulty in looking back and that difficulty in trying to um repurpose or reposition maybe but that, but then also that you know when we we i say we you know the, the viewer or the audience or maker looking back and going through you're always in it right so then you also always have to think about yourself you know how 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 am i what is my place in relation to that event what is my place in relation to this thing that i want to be looking at you know so so that for me um is what's going on maybe it's not a refusal of the gaze i'm not quite uh, i don't quite understand uh, then the refusal of the gaze yeah i i mean i found that concept quite interesting because there is um, almost like a two-way mirror sort of effect in some of the in some of the work where there's a sense of reflection or resistance you know to to being able to focus like you at one point you said well then you're not sure what you're looking at and, th and there is that in a number of the images where on the one, they seem to make sense, but they don't. So they're kind of like, there's a, a, a strange um, operation where um, the, the image that you mentioned, Kaman, is actually very much in focus. You know, the surface is, is very detailed and yet it appears to be one of the most abstract images in of the, that body of work because we don't actually know what we're looking at. And there's a, so it's an interesting kind of um, uh, a, a rejection perhaps of this process of, of looking and, and making sense of something. Um, I wanted to actually ask, because we've been talking a little bit about looking back and um, in a number of works in the series, in your series, whether you sort of visually refer or picture earlier work but it's something that did come up in our previous kind of discussions of looking back on your work and how you kind of make work now and make sense of your previous work um, and and you've also talked Gaman about um, you know, being able to make work um, uh, after uh, the project that you showed and, and I thought it was curious that you were also making a two-channel video work so I kind of wanted to ask you um, how do you relate to your earlier work now? Like, how does that um, affect uh, what you're working on? Uh, this is one of your kind of questions of what does it mean to make work and come to term with one's body of work now? How are you kind of approaching that, that kind of that question? Wait, this is a question for both of us, right? <laughs> I'm pointing it to you. Um, it's it's not, but it's something which you know we'll come back to. The way in. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm still in the middle of it. I'm still in the middle of trying to process. I'm just maybe I'm just I'm still in the middle of trying to come to terms or understand my 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 work and my process and what I can and cannot do now. And similar to, maybe similar to Weiling is like my, my daily life has changed a lot and um, needing to, needing to like shift how I, I make work. And, you know, I haven't, I haven't been back to Hong Kong since the, you know, since the July of 2019, end of July. And, and so much has happened since then. Um, that I don't know when I'll be back. And even if I were to be back, you know, the, I could never make those pictures again. I just know that, you know? And so like knowing that 
trying to come to terms with that. Um, you know, also knowing that I, I need to, I need to keep going. Um, for the majority of the past, uh, I would, you know, I guess it's like 18 months or 20, 20, uh, two years, like my, my work, my process has changed. I, I've been doing more writing than photography um, and really just being more intentional about um, the choices that I make um, as a, as a visual artist and like, so that's really, that's really shifted for me, you know. Yeah. I wanted to ask about your writing. It's not, not that I've read, but that I was just saying that I was reading, you know, that how you describe your work, but then in terms of um, how it, it, it really transported me hearing your voice, you know, so, so I don't know how to say this, but the, it feels that your, your voice and the words um, are very similar to when I look at some of your photos. So I, I don't know if that's a, a well, I guess it wouldn't be a conscious thing because that's how you write, right? <laughs> but, but, but then at the same time, um, how do you see the relationship between, I guess, words and your photographs? I know that you were saying that also is because you just in the last years it's been hard to go and photograph and go to people's homes and that's a practical matter. But at the same time, I, I feel that the the kind of lyricism with which you speak, um, it, it really it parallels in your, your image making. So then I'd like to ask if you thought about it. Uh, in that way. Yeah, I I think I mean I've I've always valued I've always valued reading and writing in the in. But I think what what really shifted was um, when I in moments where I couldn't leave the house, like um, the being able to write helped me help transport me out um, of being like confined, um, and then also helped me process um, like everything that's been happening and being able to sort of use it to sort of tell telegraph because in all the the writing that's been published recently they were there were there were prompts where I was writing to something someone else like the in, it's an interview that I'm writing to someone else and we're in dialogue or in the book that Christopher Keho edited um, with Daisy it was um, the prompt was to write a letter to someone and so I wrote I think it was like 14 letters 14 unfinished letters to um, Rinko Ocean when he was just several months old obviously not able to read and still not able to read yet, but in this idea of that, like, that it, it is, there's a direction out. It's me speaking to someone else um, in hopes of actually just like getting out of my head for in, you know, in that moment. Can I, I ask, uh, can I ask another question? And uh, I'm just going to quote you from one of our oh, no. <laughs> conversations a few weeks ago, where just think about writing, you were talking about your writing, and you were saying that writing can do more. And it's about letting go of what photo can do. Um, so, so what is the do you remember? Or do, what do you think of as the, the kind of short the shortcomings then? Of photography, when when you think like that, are there? Um, it, am I? I don't know if I'm making it direct. Right. I'll just. There are so many shortcomings of photography. Um, I don't know that. I mean, we've talked about it too. That like it's like, it can be transactional. It can be extractive, and it can just. It can often do harm, you know, um, and uh, you know, it just it it comes with such a loaded history. Like every, I feel like every time I pick up a camera, I have to like contend with that, and before I can even make something, um, there are already so many pictures in the world. <laughs> Why make more? Um, yeah, yeah, but but what about you, Wailing? What? <laughs> yeah. 
What do you mean? I don't know. There's but... a point where in you know when we started talking about the bridge project and it was kind of 2018, if not even earlier, and it was really an extension of the other the shore and some of those interviews had already begun and there was a point where you know, it became as you just said it became difficult you know if not impossible to make the kind of that you thought you were going to make um, and there's lots of reasons for that but I'm I'm wondering you know aesthetically also you know how that shifts for you um, and even I mean even you know in points of detail um, in Gaman, in your work as well, there's a, a I can't get around the, 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 the presence of light. There's a lot of, you know, natural light coming in through open sort of doorways and windows and, and a sense of radiance sometimes. Um, and I'm not sure to what extent that's something that's worked out or resolved with the people that you're photographing. Um, you know, as part of the, the image that you're building, you know, this is the way that you've talked about it. Um, but I, I see something similar sometimes in your earlier work, where, being, where people are you know, choosing to be pictured, often in their homes, um, you know, safe and, and familiar spaces. But the light that's there is, you know, very kind of tender is perhaps not the, the right word, but there's a sense of something familiar and intimate. And it's, it's not necessarily stark, even if it's like, you know, sort of punchy kind of colors and so on. So I wonder if those sorts of very aesthetic kind of choices um, have changed for you, like if they no longer work um, in the same sorts of ways. Um, I think that, I think for many years, you know, as, as Kaman had said, when you work with people, it, it's, it's quite hard, you know, in, in, the sense, in the sense of how do you uh, do right by them, right, so to speak, but then at the same time, what does that even mean? You know, how do you trust somebody to say yes? You know, in a, in a, in a way, uh, I guess when, when Tama talks about something being called hello, something being extractive or something being, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, um, transactional, things like that. But um, for me, I started having difficulty photographing, I think even when I was working on the other show, uh, simply because sometimes, you know, what is said, so you ask yourself, how do I think about what is said and then what I what is seen, but then also at the same time, um, in terms of the posture, if it is all always through my lens. And so, so then how can I change that? How can I... Um, How can I make, how can I implicate the viewer more, maybe? How, um, wait, my train of <laughs> Life never goes away. Um, how can you implicate? But, um, come on, do you want to actually sort of take that up? Um, are you thinking about these sorts of aesthetic processes now in a different way? And uh, I have a question in the Q and A um, as well that kind of talks a little bit to something I think related. But I'll let you respond first, or I'll invite you to respond rather. Well, in a lot of your your earlier portraits, Wailing, I'm thinking about like being like situated in in someone's home, like we're like, um, I'm thinking even as further back as like convergence, right? Like um, we are in everyone's home. There's a sense of trust um, and they're, they're letting you into their world, each, each of them. And then there's these markers of time. I remember like, there's like calendars, there's like people eating, there's this one bed with like many alarm clocks. There's just all of these idiosyncrasies of each person's home and of life lived and like um, knowing just like how that process for you is always about, it always starts with people. It's like people centric. And it's about even, I always saw it as like a different form of knowledge production because it was always based on 
like oral history and listening. Um, and that, that was always so, so key to, you know, the process like that, you know, I knew that by looking at one of those pictures that you made, that there was a lot of work to build to even get there, um, to, to even just like physically make that picture. Um, and then also like, just because a lot of the pictures, um, they're, they're looking in different ways. So they're not always directly looking at the camera. And because that gaze shifts uh, to different corners of a frame or a room, it even allowed us to enter more, you know? Um, so I'm just like even thinking about how you, like how, how those photographs like function were so key. And they were always generous. They're, there were always doors and windows and exits and, and cues and clues to like layers of time and even how someone decorates a house or walls and, you know, pictures of pictures that we were just talking about right before. Um, that, I, miss, I miss that sometimes because I don't think that, that there is any going back now. <laughs> but why, why, why? <laughs> can, we talk, can we talk for us? I'm, I'm interested, I guess, if that shift is something that's also in your practice. And I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that it's perhaps a bit of both, but if that's something, you know, in the wider context in which you're photographing, or if it's really about, you know, where you're at. Um, and I, I suspect that it's both, but um, yeah. I think it, it just feels that there's so many photographs of people and there's so many portraits of people and there's so many self-portraits of people and it, it's, it's hard, man. <laughs> <laughs> As a potential segue, I mean, there's, you know, I think that's a lovely question that um, we have in the Q&A about um, the size of the images that you're making. And we haven't really addressed that, although, you know, there's an intimacy to the book format, of course. And I know Welling, you've also, you know, Convergences and so on has been also published as a book. How does the size of the, the image matter to the sorts of gestures or signals that you would sort of conveying Gaman via the, the picture? Does it matter to Welling your exploration in what a photograph is? Has your understanding of what size a printing image means to you changed over time? So I know that the sizes, we haven't talked about that, but for a bridge, the sizes are quite specific and there's only a certain number of sizes because they correspond to, um, you know, a kind of classic photographic paper type sizes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, do you want to talk about that first, Wailing, or, and then I'll ask Gaman as well, of, you know, how you kind of relate to this question of the size and, and I guess the encounter that people have with your work. I think the, the size is, uh, it's, it's, I think how, how the image can be encountered, that's one thing. The size is also constrained by the file size actually, because it really irritates me when I see people's works and photo prints, and there is no reason why it's pixelated, except that it's the wrong file size. <laughs> it's like, come on guys. So, so it, it's, 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 so there are a few different things that determine the size of the work. Um, you know, primarily it's how I, what I'm most comfortable with and how I want people to engage with the image. Uh, sometimes I try to push it. So for example, you know, the, in the, in the bridge, the one with the hand, uh, the, with my hand and the phone, that was something for me was how far can I push this image that it is still acceptable to me. I think in terms of the quality, the technical quality of the print. How, how, how big can it be? And that was something that was quite important because it was taking this small consumer phone. So I have an iPhone 10. And one of the things is that it's also a, 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 a kind of apparatus of its time because if you take an iPhone 13 now, you know, you can make much bigger, better quality print anyway. So then it was just with that limited technology, how big can this be? That was one thing that was important for me. Uh, so then, then for example, with the 25 frames, it was important that it was small because I wanted people to go in and close to the image. So then there is a, a sense of uh, intimacy. Uh, there is a sense of you can't just stand back and see the whole thing if you actually want to know what's going on on the TV screen. Uh, but, but then also then, but the, in terms of this small difference in that size, 
that was limited by actually the size of a still frame. So because it, it is a still frame from a video, you know, how big can that be that for me is still comfortable? So that was one thing. So then there are these kind of technical issues, these aesthetic issues, and these kind of um, uh, kind of body movement issues maybe in the space that mm -hmm. determine um, the size of a work. Like when I'm looking at, I know that I'm, I'm not, I'm only describing my experience as viewing your work through like PDFs that we've sent back and forth and through a screen. But um, when I'm looking at your work from a bridge and even the, 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 the slides, the, micros, the microscope, microscope, I'm constantly shifting, even I'm just like in front of a computer, I'm constantly shifting back and forth, back and forth, trying to understand, like seeing like the details and how the cracks in the slides start to look like branches or start to look like skin or leather um, and then going back. So it becomes this like dance in like scale shift and like experience, which is like really wonderful, even though I'm seeing it through a screen. But I'm thinking about the live streaming and the 25 frames. I'm also thinking about not just the print size, but the size of the experience. Like when you were talking about a viewer needing to actually traverse and walk across the entire install in order to see the full thing and like what does that mean so it's not just the size of print but it's like the 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 entire experience of the viewer and the, the size of that full wall um what does it mean to actually like walk that distance um and like go back and forth so there's like the space of the the living room of your friend's house um and how the everyday materials like the kids stuff that you were talking about like pin us into like they ground us into the reality of like this person's home and like the details and stuff of life and then this like thing that is like we're all watching through a screen that like but also in that space there's so many things that happen like you know when one is out on the streets protesting like um space changes we're like you traverse you traverse neighborhoods in one day um or you can also be sitting and waiting on the same block for you know hours and just even like walking becomes a physical thing that almost gets re um reenacted through like that space in the in the gallery of course i'm just imagining through a screen because <laughs> i haven't walked through your show um, so that scale, like I think maybe the question is also about like not just size of print, but really like scale, you know. I'm conscious of time, but I have one last question for both of you, which I, I sort of flagged right at the beginning. And that's, I mean, we've talked about obviously your relationship to images because of um, you know, news media and you've both commented on you know, what does it mean to put new images into the world? Um, and yet, you know, we're all taking photos on our phones and of our families. Um, uh, and this, this idea of the vernacular and the family photo that's always kind of lingering in the background to our image worlds. And the fact that, you know, you've pictured some of that as well. We've talked about images within images. I wanted to go back to, you know, both of you have the experiences of um, your own or your family's migrations and movements, which have been pictured in some way. I feel like it's a presence in your respective practices. And so I kind of wondered what that meant for you. You know, is it something that you're conscious of or that you have memories of the family photo or, you know, it, what is, is there a relationship between photography and these migrations, et cetera, that you think is specific to that sort of experience? Or is, or is it something that you don't even notice, but maybe if I mention it, you're like, oh, okay, maybe. <laughs> um, is it something that, that has, has perhaps been eclipsed, you know, by other concerns? But I'm wondering, you know, if this is in the background of your respective kind of practices in some way. I like that photo of Garmon's father at Kaitak Airport. That's very nice. <laughs> it's so hot. <laughs> I think it's like the, that's such a great question because it's the first, 
like the family albums are like the first um it's like the first pictures I knew like I mean I I mean obviously I've gone to school and I you know um but you know in in looking through these family photos that was that was my that was my visual that was my visual education you know and so I, I had that first and really only until you know high school or and then college and you know and then you know then your um your 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 like art world or like your it kind of expands but when I was growing up those were the only that was like the only thing we had like my parents weren't were an artist they worked in restaurants and so like my my understanding of how things look or are organized or what's important really came from the family album I mean is this something that's shared or what's the um what's your memory of that I think in general about working with family or my family photos I think that I actually do that quite a bit I think um with my work I, I think one of the things is also let's say for example with a microscope work um how can I make this how can I transform this or how can I I think that it's so, so for example, those photographs come from a time when I'm not quite sure what my mother thinks of it, you know? Um, so it, it is, so how can I look back and work with these images and these memories that were really not mine, you know, these, these lives that are not mine. Um, and, but then I'm, I'm a part of it, I'm a product of it, right? So, um, but how, how, how can I use it in a way, but for it not, to be hurtful, and when, uh, for, for example, um, not not for example, but then for it not to be hurtful, because also that my mother hasn't said anything, and she seems very happy about it. But it's because they, because I don't know what kind of memories it will bring up. Uh, so so then, um, so it was something for me that it was it's important for me. Then there is a level of I guess uh, what Hamad says care, uh, or also consideration in terms of then how that material is used. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a key consideration, and I think that, the, but that, but it's also uh, in this then in relation to then when you work with people, other people, other common working with other people and vibes and, and, and kind of intimate relationships that people have, it's also then again, it's it's then it's it's also a thing of how much care is there, how much do you protect, how much does somebody need protection as you are using or working with these materials. No, it's something that I, I, I really respect in both of your practices, this sense of, um, you know, we haven't talked specifically about community and yet that there's so much that we could say um, about what that means in, in terms of the ways that you have worked um, across the, at least the work that you've shared today, um, both in, in sort of creating or visualizing, you know, sort of visualizing communities, um, uh, but also just, you know, a lot of stuff that's in the background in terms of the relationships that inform the, the, the sorts of projects that you, you've been working on. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to wrap it up there. And I wanted to thank both of you for uh, sharing what uh, I think has been in the question and answer also commented on this kind of lovely sort of friendship that's um, obviously um, part of the dialogue that we, we had in mind today. So I want to thank you both for the, the preparation uh, beforehand um, and for sharing your work today. Um, that brings us to the close and it's going to be this strange usual kind of Zoom um, abrupt ending. But um, thanks also again to, to Chloe and, and Luna have been in the background um, facilitating the, the WMA and kind of Zoom. Uh, thanks very much to them again. Thanks everyone. And that's all. Thanks. Bye. Bye.